So I'm going to give you a kind of broad nickel tour of what we're doing, focusing on parts that are most relevant to the things you folks are interested in. So it's not everything we're doing, but it's a, a big chunk. So what we want to do is build systems that can fluently learn science material multimodally. And why are we doing that? Well, part of it is because I think that's part of the way to build human level artificial intelligence. So, so think about today's AI systems. They're fast, very fast. So think about a drag racer, right? But the good thing about drag racers is they're fast. The bad thing is they need a whole staff of people to maintain them. They only do one thing. They go blazing down the track super fast, and then you've got to put nitromethane back into them, and you've got to put them all back together, and the experts have to know the internals, and that's not very flexible. Whereas if you think about people, we're very flexible. We get taught by people who don't know our internals. Now, people's awfully ambitious, but, but think about dogs. You can train a dog to do useful things. You can basically give them some affection. You don't, they don't blue screen very often, OK? And, and yet, they're incredibly useful critters. So what if AI systems were more like mammals, as robust and stable as mammals, flexible, taskable? So what we're trying to do with the companion cognitive architecture is build, we think of as software social organisms, things that are organisms in that they operate over a long time. They work with people using natural modalities. For us, that means natural language and sketching. Vision would be nice, robotics would be nice, but both of those are very hard, and especially robotics has mechanical engineering and battery issues that have nothing to do with AI, and so we've, we've factored that out. Learn and adapt over extended periods of time. That's very important for building something. Weeks and months, and not because it took that long for the learning process to converge or gather all the data, right? Things that learn something, move on, learn something else, move on, learn something else, and maintain themselves without us knowing all the time the exact internals of their heads. Now, why social organisms? If you read Mike Tomasello's work, you'll find that through the animal kingdom, the things that are smartest are the things that are social. And that's no accident. Because to cooperate, you need to communicate. And that imposes all sorts of additional constraints on how you have to behave cognitively. Uh, Vygotsky, in fact, argued that much of our knowledge is learned from interactions with other people. And I think there's something to that. We, we actually think of this architecture as the first Vygotskyan cognitive architecture. And if you look at human knowledge, Yes, we know lots of stuff from walking around the world, but many things we understand we've never directly experienced. I think it's safe to say that none of you lived through the Revolutionary War. We can see molecules, albeit with a tremendous amount of extra equipment. We haven't experienced plate tectonics directly. We've experienced its indirect effects. You can make some bits of evolution happen in laboratories, but only for really small critters. And so being able to learn at the level of conceptual knowledge seems really important for capturing what human beings can do. So if you look at Newell's notion of time scale of human action as a way of understanding where this architecture fits with other cognitive architectures, things like ACTAR and SOAR, which are wonderful architectures, they've, they've taught us a lot about how skill learning works. They live kind of here. And if you look at, at the work on ACTAR, it's pushing down to here sort of biological band, how do you make a neural substrate? If you look at SOAR, it's pushing up into, into here, higher and higher things. So SOAR has been the only people who've had cognitive architectures routinely running for hours and days in, cog in simulated um, exercises. Companions is here. We don't care about these. We factor those out. Because just like when you're understanding the weather and there's multiple levels of understanding the phenomena, we're thinking cognition. There's multiple levels at which you can understand things. And ultimately, you want a story that goes all the way down. But there's issues that arise here and here that really are hard enough that if you try to have these going as well, you're not going to make progress. So that's where we are in the companions. So I've told you the big idea of companions. And we think that if you have something that's really a software social organism, um, it's a step towards human level AI. Um, I've, I've often joked that really my goal is to build a sixth grade idiot savant from Mars. Because it's not going to be from around here, okay, but we want it to be able to interact with us, although it's going to be kind of weird.
So next I'm going to talk a little bit more about the hypotheses underlying the architecture and the modalities we're using. And then I'll talk about some particular efforts that have been done mostly using companions. That's the only exception. Um, and so learning by reading, solving ranking problems from a conceptual physics book, modeling conceptual change. And I'll show you something that's very much in progress uh, that we're very excited about. Okay, so our model of analogy, and we think basically it's analogy all the way down, um, is Dedry Gittner's structure mapping theory. And so analogy and similarity involves correspondences between two structures. Here is one representation. Think predicate calculus where these arrows indicate arguments. And these lines, these red lines are correspondences. This entity goes with that one, this predicate goes with that one, and so on. Then you have some stuff in the base that's not actually in the target, so you can project that. That's these purple lines. Those are candidate inferences. Those give analogy its inferential power. Now these days, SME can actually run candidate inferences in both directions. And it does that because if you're looking at differences as well as similarities, differences called alignable differences are tied to similarities, and so you want to be able to compute those in both directions. Um, but think of it as basically a pattern completion operation, and you'll do pretty well. So there's a lot of psychological evidence supporting this, this model, and in fact, there's evidence that it occurs all the way down at medium level vision, auditory learning, learning mental models, textbook problem solving, conceptual change, and pretty much everywhere in between. So some of the evidence is computational, a lot of it's psychological, and so we think we're on pretty safe ground assuming this. So here's our three big hypotheses about how people work, and we think that's a good way to build AIs too. The first is an analogy, is a central mechanism of reasoning and learning. Um, Denby's got a, done a great job of laying this out in an essay called Why We're So Smart, which is a book chapter. It's a, it's a very fun read. The common sense in particular is analogical reasoning plus learning from experience. We laid out a while back how we think that works, but in essence, you have within domain analogies that provide robustness and rapid predictions. I see one example, I see a similar example, I can apply that old example to it without having extracted rules. That's important for rapid learning, which people often do. And then first principles reasoning does happen but it emerges slowly as generalizations from examples. So yes, there are rule-like things in our head. Exactly how they work is an interesting question, but we've done some work on actually saying, here's a good time to extract rule-like structures, and here's how to extract rule-like structures. And finally, qualitative representations are central in this because the structure mapping process actually works on qualitative representations. It provides an appropriate level of understanding for communication and action and generalization. So those are our big hypotheses. Now, how does this all work together as a piece? I'm not going to tell you about the fact that it's a distributed agent architecture and that we use KQML and all, blah, 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 all that details, right? Those are details. Here's the big picture. So you want to do some reasoning. You say, here's my new situation. So now I, I have something to compare it against, and I use candidate inferences now to give me information. And these can be particular examples or generalizations that you use to new situations and get potential things to do or things to believe or explanations for them by analogy. Now, where do you get those? You get those by analogical retrieval, a model we call MACFAC, many are called, few are chosen, which is intended to scale to human-sized knowledge bases by having a first stage that does a very simple vector dot product over flattened versions of structured representations, and the second stage uses SME over the non-flattened versions. Now, where do you get the generalizations? We have a model called SAGE that actually runs through and constructs generalizations incrementally as data comes in. And say, for us, generalizations are probabilistic. Basically, we compute frequency information for things that align. They're partially abstracted. Things eventually get thrown away if they don't match. Um, but we don't introduce logical variables. This is not generalization as an explanation-based learning. Because, hey, if we've got this step, wow, that does not show up here. Um, if we have this step, then we don't need to actually put in variables. SME can apply it to new knowledge as you like. So that's the essence of the companions architecture. Now, why multimodal science learners? If you're going to build a social organism, it needs a job. Okay? It needs a reason that people want to interact with it. 
And so I'm a great believer in apprenticeship. Hey, I have bad students. What is that but an apprenticeship system, right? And so think about what happens in apprenticeship. You start out being a student, then you take growing amounts of responsibility, legitimate peripheral participation, as the sociologist would say, and then you learn to be able to operate on your own as a full-fledged member of a community. Now, think about the crisis we're having in STEM education. You'd like to have systems that are science teachers. Well, that suggests that we grow science teachers by basically start being a science student, build up companions to the point where they can be robust science students, learn how to communicate by examples of communication with people, thereby honing their tutoring skills, and then take on the role of tutoring others. That's the long-term play. This by itself is a massive research problem. Okay, so, but you can see where it fits in the bigger picture. It's not just a random choice. Okay, now, to get there, we need a whole bunch of substrate capabilities among the modalities, but also just some bare bones reasoning. And can the stuff we're doing with analogy actually go all the way? So I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna review a couple of experiments that show you that. So AP physics, y'all remember these, right? So I have a building, it's 100 meters high. After four seconds, where's the ball? And so you sit there and crunch some equations. How many think it's 20 meters? 40, 80, 120? But nobody thinks 120, right? Building's only 100 meters tall. Right, so nobody thinks that. Okay, now. What do you do with these? Well, we were lucky enough to have a, the Educational Testing Service as a collaborator on the DARPA program, and they trained and tested a companion on part of the AP Dynamics exam. This was a hoot. The PSYCOR taught them how to tweak their problem generator so that it actually produced predicate calculus representations. Um, so it, it was given AP physics style problems represented in predicate calculus. In fact, you can download those from Matt Klink's website, the ones that were used in the evaluation. After the quiz, each quiz was given work solutions to problems. So we'd get four problems, we would try them, and it, the work solutions were predicate calculus versions of things like this. They're not in terms of the problem solver's internal operations. Neither PSYCOR nor ETS knew how our problem solver worked. Okay? Very high level is talking about steps, things to check, Sanity check, 100 meters is greater than 80 meters, the height of the buildings, like the answer. And so to really make sure the system was transferring, it started out with no equations, thereby guaranteeing its initial score would be zero. Okay? It had skills to solve equations, but didn't actually have any equations of physics. So they tested transfer against six different variations of problem types, numerical variation, tiny, who cares, large, like the building being only 40 meters tall. Um, different query parameters asking for things like, after how many seconds is it 80 meters down, adding distractors, composing two different types of problems to, to form the whole answer, okay? And DARPA, you know, they love evaluation, so you do this evaluation where the ETS ran a companion remotely because it's running on a cluster. Um, you don't get behind ETS's firewall, right? So this had its own technical problems. And this is with no training, zero as we expect. But then the very instant it gets the work solutions, whammo, it got over 70% correct and kind of stayed there. Yes? Just a quick question to make sure I understand. Yes. The one through seven on the top right, that's the uh, work solution to the problem? Yes. And is that an abstraction of the work solution translated for you know, conciseness and natural language? Or yes. That's actually what the program was given. That's, 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 the program was given predicate calculus. <coughs> right, yeah. right. But not in its internal vocabulary of the problem solver. They literally didn't know what it was. Okay, and now, of course, on the transfer condition, wham, 60 some odd percent. Now, that's nice. I mean, DARPA said, tell us in advance what your metric will be and we didn't know what the metric definition was. So we said 50%. Okay, so we, we, we beat our numbers and got to go on. Um, 
But now, of course, when you look at the problems and look closely, there were th three classes of problems here in the system. First was just some simple parameter tuning. If we gave the thing 15% more resources, it would have solved a bunch more problems. Um, if we had to combine different kinds of problems that were symbolic and numeric, it thought it had to be one or the other, but in fact, some of them were both. And finally, ETS actually screwed up in some of their encodings. And if you fix all those three things, instead of 70%, you get 98%, which is sort of more what we expected, given that we're starting with kind of highly refined fuel here. OK, so that, that um, is one example. Um, here's some, a few others. Um, learning physics by cross-domain analogies. So base domain being linear kinematics, targets being rotational kinematics, electricity and thermal. Not a whole lot in thermal, but there's still some transfer. Uh, MacFat got the correct retrieval only 40% of the time. You'd expect that from psychological results. In fact, you'd expect less. Um, it just it didn't know, have very much in its memory. And cross-domain transfer worked well. If it had a precedent, it got the, uh, the it transferred the right stuff to solve the new problem 87% of the time. We also did transfer learning of GGP games, general game playing. Let me show you what those are like. Um, so this is an escape game by uh, John Laird at Michigan where you had to build stuff to make a bridge to get to the exit. This is a little version of Rogue that Tom Henricks built. And this is a little version of Mummy Maze, although you know, it has a soldier and a gun and an enemy terrorist you know, who has to be killed. Um, these are examples of families of games an independent contractor built 60 new games, including things that weren't in these genres but other genres. And so your system had to first learn a base game and then was given a target game to analogize to. And you measured how much that helped. As far as I know, this is the largest experiment for cross-domain analogies that anyone's ever done. So, a companion basically would learn HTN strategies for base games by experimentation. And by learn, I mean rapid learning. It played 10 times. If it couldn't master it in 10 times, it wasn't going to. And these games are not that hard. If you've got a knowledge-rich system, we don't know the games, right, because the games aren't being built by us. We know general properties of them, like they're 2D tile games. 59% of the time, we got positive transfer. We would have done 50% better at learning if we had the transferred stuff. And 15% of the time, we actually had negative transfer. And there, the negative transfer wasn't very much. We would have learned 26% slower if we had that transfer. So yeah. how, are you, how are you translating the game into the uh, kind of concept representation that uh, the, the analogy system uses? Well, GGP has a whole representation language called GDL, Game Description Language. And our system took that in as input. And 150, a, a ginormous, like 15 page prologue program, essentially, turned that into predicate calculus automatically. And again, you know, we didn't run the thing during evaluation, an independent contractor ran it. So pretty harsh, pretty harsh. Now what about modalities? Suppose you're a geoscientist. You'll give students things like this, a picture. And you say, OK, what's here? You're supposed to identify what kinds of things are there. So that's a fault. These are marker beds. These are the direction of slippage, and so, so on. And if the student draws those things, you know they understand it. Now, one of the things we've done with our sketching system is to actually build educational software around this. Authors can make sketch worksheets that will give feedback on things like this based on an analogy with an instructor's sketch. They've been used in a um, middle school biology classroom and showed improved pre-post performance in a unit on the heart. A whole bunch of worksheets were generated to cover an entire intro geoscience class at University of Madison, Wisconsin. And those um, were actually compared against paper worksheets, which nobody does because paper is too hard to grade. And in most cases, the two led to the same pre-post gains. In a couple of cases, Cog Sketch was better. In a couple of cases, the paper ones were better. But the point is, it's many, 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 many hours to grade the paper worksheets, which is why they don't do them. And with Cog Sketch, it's pressing a button. 
And so the efficiency of grading with no loss in accuracy is a big plus for education. It's also a way of thinking. So this is a sketch by Shona Trescott, who's an artist. She was on a polar expedition, and you'll see there's some, some people there. And you know some words here, white, no distinct horizon. She's perfectly capable of painting. So for instance, that's the painting she made once she was in a place where paints wouldn't freeze. <laughs> okay. And that sketch was her way of figuring out what to do here. And so sketching is insanely powerful. It's a way we communicate with others. It's a way we communicate with ourselves. So here's what you'd like to do. You'd like the software that sees sketches as people do. Now, what does that mean? You'd like to have something look at this and say, well, the block's going to slide to the right and down. CogSketch can do that, by the way. You draw that in CogSketch in the design coach, and it will basically figure out this. Um, you want fluent, natural interaction, because that's something people are able to do very well. You want human-like visual and spatial processing. You want conceptual reasoning about the sketch. And finally, you want it to be domain general. Right now, with sketch recognition systems, you have a new sketch recognition system and newly trained recognizers for every domain you do. That doesn't scale. OK? Now, if you think about sketch recognition, they focus on that. And they don't really care about these other things. Our approach is really different. We focus on everything else. When people sketch with each other, they talk. Sometimes you can have recognition work for you, but it's a catalyst as opposed to a requirement. And really, recognition isn't the main point of sketching. It's understanding the content of the sketch. So here's the key ideas in CogSketch. Perceptual processing produces qualitative spatial representations. And this is a bet about humans, which we think is also a good bet for machines. So here's an example of that, that ramp. So we have our block and a ramp. And they touch directly, which is computed visually. Because they touch directly, CogSketch computes an edge, which is the surface contact here. And it figures out the surface normal qualitatively in quadrant three. So the surface normal is there, right? And now we have gravity. And that's a force applied to this object. And so that means the net force in the block is down. And now you have a translational constraint because of all this that says it can't just go down. And so it's actually able to reason then if there's a translational motion in quadrant four, i.e. to the right and down. OK. That's actually looking at the TMS justification for the answer in Design Coach. That's a concept map version of what it does. So that's literally at some abstract level how it's doing the reasoning. So the second big idea is that structure mapping processes are used in visual reasoning. And here, we use tasks that are human norm tasks. Classic Evans analogy, A is to B is C is to one of these things. If you download CogSketch from the distribution, it has two sketches, one a small one with a couple of examples, and another that has all of Evans' original examples. The CogSketch model um, does um, all the examples correctly, and it also predicts human reaction times. In fact, when you add in working memory um, constraints, it'll actually, um, the R squared with human timing information is like over 0.9. It's ridiculously good. It's also been used in um, Raven's progressive matrices. This isn't a real Raven's problem because you have to protect the security of the test. It's better than most adult Americans. And again, it predicts reaction time behaviors very well. Um, the visual oddity task used by Dehane and Spelke looking at Americans versus Mundaruku. You have to pick the odd one out here which I think you can all do pretty easily. And um, again, analogical comparison is used in here. Same analogy model used for everything else. And again, what's hard for the model is hard for people and vice versa. And ablation studies on the model, not the people, um, can actually give you some insights into the differences between the two cultures. So we think this is an incredibly powerful way of dealing with sketching. Now for language, most people are trying for broad coverage, want to read the web, and all that's very good and noble. We don't really care about that. Human cultures simplify syntax for kids. And we think that's a good thing to do. So our language system uses James Allen's trains parser off the shelf, research like KB contents, complex lexicon. We use discourse representation theory, which if you haven't read it, oh my god, 
it's wonderful. And if you're going to implement it, it has, it's how you can handle logical versus numerical quantification. It gives you counterfactuals. It gives you all sorts of representational power. And let me tell you, the site KB makes it very easy to implement. You can use micro theories to implement these things very, very nicely. We have a query-based abductive semantic interpreter that's looking for narrative function. What's the purpose of this statement? So for instance, in doing moral decision making, it's using the fact that it knows it's doing moral decision making to look for choices and look for sacred values and try to understand it that way. And so it can automatically disambiguate. Um, and so that gives us out a formal representation of meaning. Um, here's an example from the moral decision making work. Because of a dam on a river, 20 species of fish will be extinct. There's the predicate calculus that gets produced. And if you're a fan of psych, you'll recognize a lot of these predicates. They'll be old friends. Um, and here's the uh, boxology that discourse representation theory fans will like. OK. So in fact, if you go to the QRG Lab channel on YouTube, you'll see a video of a companion being taught tic-tac-toe by a combination of language and sketching. It's a lot of fun, but off base here. Now, one of the first ways this was used was Kate Lockwood's thesis, where she took a chapter from a Navy basic machines manual that introduced ideas like levers, sketched the diagrams in it, simplified the English. This is some simplified English from it. You'll notice that there's an explicit pointer saying, hey, go look at this sketch when you're reading this stuff. Now, this, at that time, 2009, was only semi-automatic. Okay, she, the system would basically pop up a set of choices when it couldn't make the right choice in language, and she would, would click on the right choice. What she was focusing on was looking at multimodal integration, how do you integrate diagrams and sketches. So Mayer has this lovely theory that says you pay attention to something in both, you figure out how to organize, how to understand it, and then you integrate it somehow. And you integrate it somehow, he says, well, you align them somehow. And of course, Kate hearing that says, well, okay, I've got a natural language system, I got cog sketch, and I can align them with SME. And that's, in fact, what her system does. And in fact, um, she was a little macho. She, her system only got 12 out of 15 homework questions at the back of the chapter correct. Um, she basically decided that the only problem solving method it was going to have was using analogy on the examples in the text. <laughs> OK. And so if she'd gone a little bit more into the text, um, I think it could have done even better. Now, we've also looked at reading instructional analogies. So again, this is simplified English from a book by Sean Buckley on solar energy, which also he uses analogy throughout. And there's diagrams on almost every page. And so it's talking about what happens in terms of um, leakage of heat by analogy with a hole in a bucket. Um, this is part of David Barbello's thesis, by the way. And so what David did was identified a set of analogical dialogue acts. So you're, in, you're extending a base and target, but you don't really start thinking about those until you see something that introduces an analogy. So something is like something else. You start saying, oh, maybe I should be interpreting this as an analogy. And so now it's going off and trying to identify these things. You know, this is the base, that's the target. Sorry, this is the target, that's the base. And so this must be extending the target, that must be extending the base. There's acts for introducing candidate inferences. And if you do that, uh, David took 13 example texts from multiple documents, multiple domains, simplified the syntax, and um, developed 22 textbook style questions, and looked at a two by two design with analogy and without analogy, with background knowledge, no background knowledge. And if you look at the no analogy case, it could solve one problem. A lot of background knowledge in psych, but not enough to do these problems. You put in analogy, and with no background knowledge, it was able to do 36% of them, and with analogy, 82%. Not bad, actually. Now, we've also used this for problem solving with diagrams and sketches. Again, if you can't reason flexibly, multimodally, this isn't going to work. Learning isn't going to work. So um, in fact, work the preceded project Aristo, OK, uh, by Vinay Chowdhury suggested that 48% of the AP Physics exam questions use diagrams, and 28% require diagrams for answering them correctly. It's not just a memory aid. And if you look at Hestony's force concept inventory, two thirds of the questions use diagrams. And that's something that you use to understand if people really understand physics or if they just memorize the equations. 
So you got to do these things. So we started looking at ranking problems. There's a lovely book called Conceptual Physics by Hewitt. Here's an example ranking problem. You're supposed to rank the tension in the left rope from most to least. Okay. So which of these has the most tension? How many think this one has the most tension? How about this one? How about this one? Okay. And the least? This one? This one? This one? Ah, these are hard problems. Um, that's the right answer. C has the most tension, B has the middle amount, and A has the least. And you'll see how the system computes it in just a minute, and that'll convince you it's the right answer. I hope. Okay, so you start by sketching it in CogSketch, and it computes spatial relations, like the right rope is to the right of the left rope, and it hangs, scaffold hangs from these two ropes. And it's analyzed using qualitative mechanics, which we've been working on for a long time, but John Wetzel was the guy who figured out how to make it work with the kind of um, noisy data that you get in sketches. So it figures out there's a force applied in the down direction by the two people, and then quantities get detected, like there's a tension in the y direction in the right rope and the left rope, and those are implemented using qualitative process theory. Okay, now, differential qualitative analysis. You're doing ranking problems, you want to know one's bigger than another. So you're comparing these situations. Yes, sir? So, so when you enter something to cog sketch, you conceptually label things. You say that's called the scaffold. That's called the scaffold. That's called a rope. These are attached to it, so those arrows indicate a relationship. And the, by the way, those little yellow arrows indicates that cog sketch believes that that's the head of the arrow and that's the tail of the arrow. Okay, and he told it that this was a person and it was named man one, and this was a person that was named man two. That happens through a menu-driven interface. Yeah. So it's it's a lot of it. A lot of the basic information of the kinds of objects that exist is contents from the psych knowledge base. The causal laws are expressed using QP theory in models we've added to the knowledge base. So think of it as we take the latest copy of research psych, we pin it down to the table, suck out all the knowledge, throw the reasoning engine away because we have our own reasoning engine. Theirs is really good for a lot of things, better than ours in some ways. But in ours, analogy is more primitive than backchaining. Okay, so for us, it's the right thing to use. And then we add in our own stuff. So the discourse representation theory, semantic interpreter is mostly knowledge driven. That's Hornclaw's rules plus a lot of predicates. Okay, stuff like that. Warren, you had a question? I think it was along the same lines. I think you answered it. So write up, for example, I guess would either come from research psych or from your add on. Well, the predicate write of comes from research psych. It gets automatically computed by cog sketch based on the interpretation that you're looking from the side of something. It's a physical diagram. And if, for instance, it were an abstract diagram, it wouldn't compute write of. Or rather, it would compute write of for the visual glyphs for which that still holds true, but not for their interpretation as physical objects. Okay. And right rope is a term that the person yes. added as a name. That's right. I can tell you the internal name for that concept is something much uglier. Right. right. But we, 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 we want people to understand the example without going crazy. Okay. So differential qualitative analysis, which was actually a beautiful theory of that was developed by Dan Weld at UW um, as, as, part, as his PhD thesis. We do it a little bit differently. The idea of differential qualitative analysis in terms of the actual concepts is great, but we do in DQ analysis, you have to compare these two things, right? And to compare these two things, you have to align them, and we use SME for that, because what the hell? It's an analogy. So we compare the problem choices with SME. Given a goal quantity, you try to determine normal ordinal relations between them. And so you look at numerical values if they're around, visual quantities. Here, geometric distance is going to matter a lot, as you'll see in a second. Ordinal relations between quantities without numerical values, like for instance, if you're thinking about how heavy someone's going to feel on different planets, um, greater than the mass of Jupiter, mass of Earth, 
combined with the acceleration is qualitatively proportional to the force, you know, those are things you can infer, right? So that's an example of a causal statement that says, all else being equal, increase this, that goes up. OK, now our scaffold. The causal models get instantiated for each of these things. And one of them is that the y tension is qualitatively inversely proportional to the distance of the left thing from the center of mass. OK, that's what gets bound to, to group here. And so our goal quantity is the tension in the left rope. So now you look at the qualitative proportionality and you say, well, OK, that means I have to look at the distance between the left rope and the center of mass. So Cog sketch computes those distances. And you know, as a visual measurement, the biggest distance, other way around actually, is from um, here. And the smallest distance is from here. That's just broken. Um, and so by the negative influence, since this has the smallest distance, this has the biggest tension, this has the biggest distance, this has the least tension. So it's using the distance between these two to compute the center of mass. What about the, the mass of the balloon? Probably gets incorporated in there too. Um, but it's basically assuming uniform density. It doesn't assume this is like a little heavy thing embedded in here or in there. Right. You know, those are good default assumptions for, for sketches. And if they're wrong, someone's supposed to tell you about them. Rice for science authors. OK, now how well does this work in general? So uh, Maria basically extracted uh, 27 ranking problems from the first um, several chapters of conceptual physics. Um, she focused on 12 problems involving vector addition, tension, and gravity, um, leaving out things on Newton's third law and potential energy and friction and reasoning over time just to have a good starting point. And so the additional problems those require other aspects of QP theory that weren't included here. Solve 12 out of 12 of the problems, as you might expect, because we selected the subset of the problems, big duh. Um, the diagram is unnecessary for two out of the 12 problems, because it gave numerical information that really was key, and they used the diagram as sort of a holding point for it. If you look at the kinds of spatial information needed, uh, the vector addition problems needed to, you had to detect major axes, you had to use the parallelogram rule, interpret arrows and arrow length. And for tension, you had to think about distance and approximate center of mass. So you know, if you expand the class of problems, you'll expand the range of concepts that you have to know to understand these things. And what we want to do is not do this by hand anymore, but start doing this by interacting with the system and teaching it these things. Now, why do we think we can do that? Well, a long time ago, Deidre and I started thinking about how is it people learn knowledge about the world? And, and we can, came up with this model where we start out with experiences, and those give rise to causal generalizations. And eventually, you extract those into conceptual models, and you, and you get expert refinements. So, okay, equations come in here. And here you get sort of, here and here you get, here you get some constructs from QP theory, here you get the whole thing. And we've actually done point modeling at every step of the way. That is, we've by no means done this for everything in all the domains you do this in as a human, but we've done studies at each level to kind of get confidence that this story could work. So with Scott Friedman, we've looked at developing prototypical behaviors from experience, and in fact saying things like, here's, it's now time to move this into something that's more rule-like. Learning conceptual models from experience, again, part of Scott's thesis. Using interactive analogy to debug mental models, and um, cross-domain analogical learning, and also expert novice differences in analogical strategies for problem solving. They're doing engineering thermodynamics and showing that, for instance, experts use qualitative reasoning to rule out possible bad moves when they're doing problem solving. I'm going to focus in on one of these things, which is modeling conceptual change, because it argues for the central role of analogy in these things in a very cool way. So Scott's idea is this. Humans, you know, you think about the literature and situation, situated cognition, and it shows that people are very concrete in some ways. They have knowledge that's sort of in pieces, as Andy DeSessa would put it, okay? And yet, when you have a particular experience, you can tell a coherent story. 
Scott's way of putting those things together is to say, well, look, you organize your memory in terms of explanations about particular situations. And so if I have a new phenomenon I'm trying to explain, I retrieve, using analogical retrieval, i.e. MACFAC, a prior example I've explained before. I don't just try to slap that down by analogy. In Scott's case, Scott said, well, no, let's actually use the model fragments in that explanation and apply them abductively to the new phenomena. If you're familiar with the CBR literature, this gets around the whole problem of adaptation. It says we're going we're to reason through these things and figure out how they apply. So if there's different numbers of things or different types of things, that gets handled by this reasoning step. That new information can trigger conceptual change. You may get a contradiction with things you believe. You might have a lower cost explanation, in which case you say, oh, well, I should, I should think of it that way instead. And then that new explanation has a pointer from the old. So if you retrieve the old explanation, you'll get the old explanation but say, hey, there's a better one over here. And he also proposed some strategies for actually going through and doing more serious revision internally. I'm a little more dubious about those. I think those may not be that plausible for human beings. OK, now does this work? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a bit of breadth, and I'll go into one example in depth. So Scott used this to model intuitive motions, sorry, intuitive models of force and motion. So we basically draw comic strips using CogSketch. He's actually quite a good artist. That's his hand-drawn shoe. Um, and basically, it learns trajectories. If, if you look at its model of force over time, it actually follows a path that human students follow. At one point, you could ask a human student, is the table pushing up on this glass of water? And they'll say, no, because if it were, the water would be rising. Okay. And at some point, Cog Sketch actually falls for that same problem. It gets past it eventually. In looking at an experiment by Mickey Chi, where she gave students a passage on the heart, looked at their starting mental models, the pre part of the arrow, and then you had people either read it twice, and you notice here the double loop model, only two students get to that, one person was already there, and everybody else ended up here. Okay, in a model that's better than they had, but not that much better. Versus you read it once and you do self-explanation, and a lot more of them got to the double loop model. So it turns out Scott made representations for those different models, same pre and post, and basically his model, by changing differences in preferences for explanations, captured 90% of the student model transitions, which is pretty good for these things. And finally, Bruce Sharon did some great protocols on looking at kids explaining why the seasons change. And so um, there's all sorts of explanations like it, but if you say, well, it's winter in Chicago, but that means it's summer in Brisbane, Australia, they're going to have problems with it because the usual explanation is it's distance from the sun. And he looked at the different models kids had and the transitions they went through and was able to capture those model transitions. I'm going to show you in, in more detail one very cool example where you're looking at what happens when you do analogy and how analogy can go wrong, OK, and how you can fix it. So day-night cycle. Why is there day and night? It's quite a puzzle for kids of a certain age. So you got day, sun shining down. You understand that. One model, and these are all models that have been found in the literature, um, one model is the moon blocks the sun, which we know happens when there's a total solar eclipse, right? But it's not a whole bunch of hours a day. Okay, so that doesn't work very well. Clouds block the sun. It's another common model. Yet another model is the sun just turns off. Click. Great model, right? Talk to someone else and it's, it's still lit over there. That's going to be a problem. Um, I love this one. The sun enters the earth. Because when it sets, you can see it, right? It's going inside. Of course, it's going to get dark. Um, and then finally, the, the boring one, the Earth rotates, and that's why we don't see the sun anymore. Okay. Now, Stelavos Nyadu, a Greek cognitive scientist, said, I'm going to improve the way kids learn this by using an everyday analogy. I told you she's Greek for a reason. So analogies are often provided in instruction to help correct students' misconceptions. We want to know, can a companion actually benefit from that? And will it, like sometimes happens with students, give rise to new misconceptions? OK. Uh, her analogy was gyros. You have meat cooking on a spit. 
the meat rotates, okay? And that's the sun, and the meat is the earth, okay? So we're cooking the earth. And third graders and fifth graders could recall the correct explanation better with the analogy than without. So now, can a companion actually overcome misconceptions by using the analogy? Because if you've got a misconception, you're not mapping to an empty base domain. You're mapping to a base domain that could actually send you seriously awry. Okay? So that's a potential worry. So um, here's an example of one of Scott's encodings of the model. This is the one where the sun goes inside. So you have uh, the, greater, the amount of light in Chicago is greater than day and night. And that's enabled between these two state differences, one of which is exiting a container, one of which is entering a container. So you can kind of see where that model is going. Now the inputs were misconceptions encoded in predicate calculus by hand, model heroes encoded in predicate calculus by hand, just to avoid any confounds from natural language errors. We can now do automatic disambiguation even without a task, but the automatic stuff without a task is like 87% accurate, at least on the text we've tried so far, and it hasn't been that many. So if you really want to make sure that you know what you're getting, um, you still have to do some hand coding. We couldn't resist putting in the key correspondence by language, of course, given the analogical dialogue acts. The fire is to heroes as the sun is to the earth. And that produces these two statements, which are then used as part of the analogy. Okay. So feedback. Basically, the only feedback we uh, gave it was it uh, was allowed to ask us about entity correspondences. So I believe clicking state corresponds to day state. And those are the things you can say back. And here we say the answer is yes, that's correct. And I believe heroes rotating to include heroes side cooking from fire. Now, why the hell is that big thing an entity? Because we use a Davidsonian representation for events. And so that's the Davidsonian representation for that event. Um, corresponds to the sun entering the planet Earth was so included from Chicago. And here, again, the same questions. It's a template. But we say D. No, that does not belong in the mapping. That's a strong clue, right? That's saying, do not include that in any correspondence in the future. OK, and the SME will then find some other solution. And um, here's an example of analogical inferences. So there's something like, Scola means something like, it's basically an entity you're proposing. So there's something like a, rota a rotation periodic and the object rotating is planet Earth, and the sole cause, the type of sole cause for not being visible from Chicago, the sun, is the occluding rotation. That causes a contradiction, which means the system has to find a new explanation. Um, various other things, including that some of the ingredients of planet Earth include something like beef and something like lamb, which for Hiros, yes, indeed, is an actual um, plausible inference. It really is mechanical. You know it's a machine when it does things like that. Um, and here are the results for the six models and no model, just to take it away here. So SME got errors in most of the conditions, except for the correct model. And it turns out, um, without feedback, it actually still glitched. It needed feedback to overcome the misconceptions it got here. But the others it was actually able to overcome. So that was, that was a bit reassuring. And with the entity level feedback, which, which to be sure is fairly powerful, um, actually let it gets, gets them all correct. Now what does this tell us? Well, first analogy can indeed repair misconceptions on 60% of the models without feedback. It actually got to the correct model. And always in this case when feedback is allowed, for more complex things, it's not gonna happen. Mapping errors can lead to new misconceptions. Oh, indeed, when you look at the internals. In the moon blocks the sun model, the analogy led to Hiros being mapped to the moon of Earth, which implies Chicago is on the moon, which I think most students would not accept, OK? And that the moon's rotation causes the day-night cycle. So it got the rotation was a cause, just the wrong thing rotating, OK? So that's, unfortunately, a new misconception. Now, there's a whole bunch of things not captured by this simulation, and here are two of the most important. One is students resist changing misconceptions. Paul Feltovich has laid this out beautifully. Um, he calls them mental shields like in Star Trek. Shields up, rah, rah, contradictory data, rah, rah. and everyday knowledge is another thing that is sort of keeps separate from school learning. 
And the second is there's lots of individual differences in the efforts student expend in reasoning through an analogy. So this is a student that's like really hyper, but what it does, it always does. And of course with humans, there's lots of variation. They may be off today, they may not get it, all sorts of things are different. So this is more like a ranging shot to see what's going on. Now let me wrap up. I'll tell you one next step that uh, we're particularly excited about, part of Maria's PhD thesis. So you suppose you're explaining to someone about a cell, how a cell works. Got all these parts, they do a bunch of stuff. And so one way you can do that is by analogy. A cell is like a city. So she also draws a city, okay, emphasizing the parts that are important. Now, she's not making this analogy up. This is actually from a book of analogies that are designed for science instruction. So these are instructor-tested, instructor-vetted analogies. And we're seeing, can we build companions up to the point where we can communicate stuff to them via the same means? And so the system sits here and starts figuring out correspondences between these two things. Like, for instance, the city hall controls the city. The nucleus controls the cell's activity, and she is using simplified English to go with the diagrams and explain things like controls and produces energy and other stuff like that, okay? So it really is multimodal. Now, we've been extracting from the New York Region Science Exam and other similar standardized sources questions about cells and questions about the other domains she's working with. So we have questions that are again independently vetted. And so, um, you know, so what produces energy in the cell? Well, you know, the mitochondria are like power plants, and we know the power plants produce energy, so mitochondria produce energy is the kind of, of question she can answer. It's very early days. System still going through its first round of, of development, um, but we're very excited about this. So, other next steps, we're creating a second generation learning by reading system where we're trying to get to the point where we automatically read entire articles from the Simple English Wikipedia and Simplified Science books. And there the big challenge becomes, you're going to have errors, you're going to have misconceptions. Can we use the idea of rumination that we did in, in Learning Reader, where you use analogy and analogical generalization to ask yourself questions about new materials and try to put together things and determine what's really going on in them. And again, we're not trying to do you know, no annotated data here. All of our improvement testing is by question answering. Can you actually reason with the material? That's the gold standard for us. And so this is all in service of building companions and interactive learning systems that can learn science by being taught, which in turn is a step towards companions as a new kind of intelligent tutoring system. I want to end by thanking the massive number of people involved um, faculty collaborators, Jeff Usher is the main architect of CogSketch. These folks are now all happily ensconced elsewhere in the current set of grad students. Thank you. <laughs>